Okay, here in Four Points, while you have a seat, can we thank these guys for leading us in worship so well? Good morning, Tony Colvin. Hello, all of you out there online. It is great to see you guys. Feel free to sit down. Um, hello, out online. It is good to see you. Thanks for joining in. If I don't have the chance to know you, uh, my name is Will Davis, Jr., and I want to greet all of you that are here in the house. You've been rowdy this morning. Thank you. I feel like I got my 10,000 steps, and it's not even 10 a.m. yet. That's awesome. And... Um, you guys watching online, thank you so much. We know our congregation is significantly larger online right now than it is here in the house, and that's fine. We love it. We love that you worship with us. You're, you're part of us, and uh, we have an extended community. We have an online pastor, Jason Gordon, who does an amazing job. For all of you online, and any of you here, because we're not passing out visitors' cards right now because of the COVID, um, if you ever want to know more about ACF and how to connect with us at Bible studies, men's, women's events, uh, small groups, uh, service times, our COVID regulations, et cetera, et cetera. If you will text um, ACF Connect, one word, ACF Connect, to 512-866-9908, um, we'll get right back to you. And I'm walking around seeing so many people here, and obviously we have several hundred more online that are watching right now. Um, and over the course of the week, more than 1,000 um, if you want to know, if you want to feel like this is your home, please connect to us. We're not, we can't chase you down. We don't know how to do that. We're not going to do it. But if the point comes where you're like, I'm tired of being isolated. I want a church to know my name. We, we want it. We want to be those people. So thank you and welcome. And the Red Heart Brigade over the, I miss chatting with you guys. The Red Heart Brigade, um, chat away. So um, this is going to lead into where I'm going. I do a daily devotional five days a week called Good News Today. It's a video devotional. And uh, many of you received that. And um, I'm about ready to finish First Peter. I've been going through First Peter, I think, since September. And uh, going to finish it in February and then take a week off and then jump into something new in February. I'll tell you more about it in a little bit. And um, if you want to receive that, then just go online and subscribe. They'll get them in your inbox. Before you wake up, they'll be there. You wake up, people call me, people text me. I see people around town. And they go, I just watched your devotional. Curiously, curiously, in the timing of the Lord, I recorded this back probably in December or November. This week's topic has been on how do you do submitting to leadership? Which with the change of a guard in, in Washington and everything else that's going on, I thought that was pretty timely stuff that the Lord did. I didn't plan it that way, it just happened. So uh, you, can, you can sign up for Good News Today if you want to. The reason I bring it up is I'm teaching out of 1 Peter right now on the topic of heaven. And um, many of you will recognize some of the language and teaching of 1 Peter because you've been getting good news today. So I just thought I'd, I'd tee that up. So we're in a series called Five Things That Have Not Changed. By the way, I need to, I need to pray. I haven't prayed yet. Lord... Um, Thank you for this time. Thank you for our amazing online congregation. Thank you for the folks that are here at Four Points. Thank you for your presence. Most importantly, we feel you. Now, God, I pray you'd humble me and activate my skills and gifts and do something major and miraculous in this time. Uh, thank you for the hope of heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, five things that have not changed. We talked about God is still in control. Jesus is still real. Um, what was last? I forgot what last week was. What was last week? Oh, yeah, that thing. Prayer still works. Derp. Um, it's been a long week, okay? Um, yeah, of course I forgot the prayer one. I wanted to talk to you today about heaven. And when I first teed the topic up, I had a different intention. And, but as I've gotten into it, I wanna, I'm going to take a bit of a different angle, perhaps, on heaven. Um, in the year A.D. 64, Peter was in Rome. Peter, the apostle, who, the disciple turned apostle who followed Jesus, did not even not of his execution, became really the, the leader of the church post-resurrection for the first, maybe almost first decade before Paul kind of became the leader of the church. And um, in A.D. 64, Peter was in Rome. Uh, he calls it Babylon in his letter. And he knew things were getting hot for Christians. Um, in October of AD 64, well, in the spring of AD 64, Rome burned. And everybody kind of went underground. When in October of AD 64, 
Nero, Nero, the emperor, declared all-out war on the Christians, blaming them for that fire that destroyed Rome. Now, it had been bad for Christians anyway. There had been persecution because they were this sect that didn't play by the rules, didn't worship Caesar as God, etc. So it was getting hot. But after that fire, it is one of the most vicious, brutal, heinous attacks on any people group in our history what Nero did to Christians for multiple years and what ultimately spread throughout Europe. Peter senses that. He knows trouble has started. In fact, sometime not long after he writes 1 Peter and 2 Peter, within within AD 64, he's crucified. He's executed. So trouble's coming. And so Peter writes to a group of people who are what he calls elect exiles. They're the chosen of God, scattered throughout all this region of of Turkey and what would be the Middle East now. And he calls them exiles, not because they're living in a foreign land among people who don't worship their God. He calls them exiles because they don't belong here on earth. It's not their home. Their home is somewhere else. And this letter is to encourage them to stay the course until they're home in heaven. Okay? That's why he writes it. Um, let me read the, the text. I'm going to read three verses from 1 Peter chapter 1. If you want to find it in your smartphone or your Bible, it'll be on the screen as well. Um, after greeting them as the elect exiles, he, see, he begins, and this is how the apostles love to start the letters, with this, this ecstatic, off the top of his head, praise of God, even as bad as things are. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now... For a little while, you may have to suffer grief. You've had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. So there are, the heat was already up. They're already suffering. So if I were to ask the typical Christ follower about heaven, what is heaven? What is the meaning of heaven? I might get a twofold answer. I would get number one, and well, it's the place where God lives. And that'd be right. And you might say, secondly, it's where Christians go when they die. One of our band members, he and his wife, this morning lost a very, very close friend to cancer. We were praying for her and she passed away this morning. And she's in that place now where God is. And that's the hope we have. But if, if that's the only two reasons you have for believing in heaven, if, if we're thinking about heaven, is it okay, it's where God is, it's where I'll be one of these days then the the implication of heaven in your here and now isn't really significant. If all you think of is is a place where we get to go when we die and where God lives, then there's not a lot of street value to heaven. And, And you're missing the major, perhaps the major emphasis of heaven in Scripture. Heaven is used over 225 times in the New Testament. The least of those times, the fewest of those times is about the place where you go when you die or about where God lives. There's a whole other talk about the kingdom of heaven, the reality of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven, the reality of heaven, friends, and this is what the angle I'm taking that's unusual, is to have significant bearing on how we live right now. The fact that it's there and we're headed there and this is not our home and that's where our king lives and that's where there is justice, and that's where there's no pain or sorrow or death or tears or fire ants or anything like that, is to affect how we are to live here. We are to be representatives of heaven and the heaven mindset. We're to be missionaries from heaven to earth. We are not to to view this as all there is, because this is all going to pass away, and the reality of heaven where God lives. Genesis chapter 1 begins with light but no sun or moon. Revelation 22 ends with light, 
but nor sun or moon. The difference is the light is God. It's amazing. And so Peter says, here's, as this fire breaks out of persecution, listen, Peter doesn't give them anything on earth to hope in. He does not say, look, there's an election in two years, an election in four years, an election in November. The stock market's going to get better. We're going to find a vaccine. Uh, They're going to assassinate the emperor and start over. He doesn't give any, there's nothing of his argument here to these people to stay the course that has anything to do with things getting better on earth. Some of these people would not survive this persecution. It would be the end of their days on earth. And so he has to point them to something that is lasting, that is eternal, and that is not going to shift based on the, the tides and trends of culture or governments or rulers that don't love God, Nero. And so he says, look, I gotta give you, you gotta look up here because that's where your hope is. And if you're looking at anything down here to get you through this, you're gonna be woefully disappointed because this place is gonna let, this place might even take your life. It might even end you. So look up, look up. Wow, is that relevant? So let me tell you some things about heaven. Heaven means that our hope is reasonable. So this is, this is why you need to believe in heaven now and live as if heaven is right here because it does affect how you live. And first of all, it means that our hope is reasonable. The phrase um, that he says in, in reference to this, and I think it's in verse three, he says, you've been given a living hope, a living hope. How? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, there, there's a thing as unreasonable hope and there's a thing as reasonable hope. And unreasonable hope is, well, hope, first of all, is the expectation of something good. Okay, so I go into Baylor football season every year with hope. That's unreasonable hope. Don't, Longhorns, you should not laugh. Just saying. Okay, hook them. Longhorns, we'll see. But every year, like, this is the year. This is the year. We got a new coach and we got recruiters and we win two games. That's not reasonable hope. And we've all, we've all done that, right? Peter says, G- now remember, Peter is an eyewitness to all of this. He's not writing this stuff secondhand. He watched Jesus die and had breakfast with him a couple weeks later. So he knows the resurrection. And says, your hope, your hope is in, is in the reality of Jesus is alive. He's in that heaven. He knows your name. He's coming back for you. That's reasonable hope. So what is it that's getting you out of bed every day? If, you, if it's your hope is somehow the, the market's gonna hit 40,000 in the next five years and you're gonna be rich beyond your wildest dreams or you're gonna win the mega lottery or whatever, you're gonna take the right vitamin and stop aging and all, whatever, or the, the next president, this president, the next president, whatever is gonna be your guy or your administration or the next governor or the next, folks, that's unreasonable hope given what we're in. The expectation is something good that Peter gave these people that were being persecuted is that Jesus died and rose again and I watched it and he is alive and he is in heaven and that's why we win. That's our hope. Not in something else. We celebrated this week the life of Martin Luther King Jr. And he had a hope and that I have, if you've ever read the, the, the speech, I remember the first time I read I Have a Dream speech, the whole context of it was in college. I was amazed at it. The, the literary majesty of that, of that speech, but also just the passion of it. To watch it is one thing, to read it is something else. It's a literary miracle, it really is. And he had a hope, didn't he? He had a dream. Well, how's that dream going? I mean, he knew that only love could prevail. He wrote a book on agape love as the only means by which people's hearts will change. And he had a real hope and a dream that there'd be a day when racism and seeing people through the lens of their skin would not cause us to treat them differently or be treated differently. And we've had a rough year in that, guys. The gospel of Jesus Christ includes in it Racial reconciliation. It is part of the mystery of the gospel Paul talked about. Read Ephesians chapter 3 through the lens of racial reconciliation. You'd be amazed at how much it's in there, Jews and Gentiles. King had a hope, but it's not come true yet. It was reasonable because it's based on love, but it's still, it's, we're still fighting for it. This is a hope, heaven, 
right here, right now. Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. Romans 8, that's hope. It's reasonable. Secondly, heaven means that we have a great inheritance. Heaven means there are riches stored up for you in heaven. And they're increasing as we speak. The text here is, and into an inheritance, you've been saved into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade. An inheritance was a legal portion. Something that was allotted to you by law. And it was, it was to be protected. It was your legacy or the legacy of those above you to you. It was your um, bequest. It was your estate. Um, there was an old tradition. In fact, Jesus uses a parable based on this in Jesus' day where people would take their wealth if they had money or gold or silver or something else of value, and they bury it out in a field somewhere because the banks were either crooked or likely to be taken over. They lived in Jesus' day in an occupied country. They were citizens of Jerusalem, but they were under Roman law, martial law at that. And so the Romans could come at any time and just take what they wanted. The tax collectors were cheating, and they would take five times more than you needed to pay, give the appropriate portion to Rome, and keep the rest for themselves. So treasure wasn't safe anywhere. So the safest place for a treasure was in the ground. Because if the banks failed or the government changed or the, the new leaders came in, you could sneak in sometime, even if you lost your land, you could sneak in sometime and go dig that hole up and take your treasure and dig it somewhere else. So Jesus taught, used a parable about finding treasure in a field. That's why they did that, because nothing was safe for your inheritance. He says here, look, you have, you have something that's better than gold that will never perish, never spoil, never fade. And, it, and it's, it's in heaven waiting for you. It's, it's something beyond your imagination. And every time you pray a prayer, listen, every time you witness to somebody about Christ, every time you share your resources or your time, every time you serve somebody, every time you confess sin and repent of sin or resist sin, that treasure increases. You're storing up treasure in heaven right now by how you live. Jesus said, do, he said, do not store up treasure on earth. That wasn't a suggestion, it was a command. Do not be treasure-centered on earth. Because moth and rust and will come along and decay it, and thieves will break in and steal it. It's just stupid, he said. Randy Alcorn, in his book, The Treasure Principle, says, send your treasure ahead by making internal investments. With all the insecurity of finances and, and unemployment and the economy and all the stuff that many of us have lost so much, many of you have lost so much and, and lost so much, had so much hurt this, this last several months, last year, in a day, it can be gone. Jesus said, you have a treasure that's secure. But it's in heaven. It's waiting for you. It's waiting for you. In 1950, they started working to protect our Constitution, one of the greatest documents in human history, because it was starting to show that you know, it's 200 and something years old, and it's starting to show the, the evidence of sunlight and an aging document and, you know, not really good care in the early decades, et cetera. So they put it in a vacuum-sealed glass vault out of the sunlight that's full of helium um, to try to protect it. And even then, it's still showing now, you know, how many years have passed that, it's still showing signs of the wear and tear of being an old document. It's the best they can do to protect this treasure, it's still not protectable. It's, going to, it's fading. Not so with our treasure. Not so with our treasure. So where are you, where are you hanging? Your, where's your hope? Is it here or is it there? Where's your treasure? Is it here or is it there? Third, heaven means that we are secure in our faith. Heaven means that, that once you're adopted as God's son or daughter, you're God's son or daughter, period. This one's good. The scripture says, who through faith are shielded, shielded. 
by God's power. Um, the word shielded is the word to put it into protective custody. It's um, the combination of your faith plus God's power means that you are secure as a child of God. Now let me, now let me tell you what I'm pushing on here. Not everybody's going to agree with this, but I'm not here to debate it, so don't, don't send me an email. I'm not going to answer it, okay? The, the, the doctrine I'm pushing on is what's called the security of the believer. And the principle is that once God elects you or saves you and into his kingdom through your faith, you can't lose that. It's not a day by day, we'll see how it goes, and, and you may live all your life and get to the end of the run and realize you didn't, have, you didn't make the cut. It's once you've confessed Christ and you've been full, filled with, baptized in, sealed in his Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It's a done deal. The door closes behind you and because, because it isn't based on you to begin with. If you can go earn it, then you might can go lose it. But if it's, if it's a security set on hope and the work of Jesus, not on the work of will, then you're secure. Now, what he's do, listen, what he's doing here is some of these folks aren't going to do well under persecution. I mean, how would you do? Forgive this. This is going to be rough. How would you do if they were torturing your family? And we're saying, hey, just honor Caesar above Jesus and we'll stop all this right now. Before we light this fire and burn them up in front of you, why don't you just reject Jesus? I don't know how I'd do. I pray about that all the time. If that day ever came, I'd have the courage to be true to Jesus as my ultimate King and Lord. But some of these guys, Peter failed the night of Jesus' arrest. He failed. He betrayed him. He denied him. Had to live with that, and God restored him. But that, some of these guys are going to go through really difficult days, and they're going to pray for deliverance. They're going to hope that there'll be some way out, and they might even deny, deny that they knew God under the pressure of persecution. And Peter says, you're safe because your faith plus God's power equals your security. And folks, I need to know that because I fail daily as a Christian. And I need to know that there's not some statute of limitations on my salvation, that if I have one really bad day and God's having a really bad impatient day because there's a civil war going on somewhere and he's like, oh, sorry, Will, I'm done with you. You're taking too much of my time. I need to know that that's not gonna happen. And that's what Peter's saying here. You're kept. You're kept. And, you're going to get through this. You may die, but you're going to get through this and wind up in heaven. Paul, in his, one of his letters to Timothy, talks about being delivered safely through the trials into the heavenly kingdom. For Paul, being delivered safely through the trials meant getting off of earth and home into heaven. He didn't, they weren't hanging their hats on anything here, guys. They weren't hanging their hats on a great retirement. They were hanging their hats on heaven. You're safe. So um, the, f the first time I climbed Long's Peak, 14,256 feet and 11 inches of Long's Peak, uh, it's, the, it's the furthermost north 14er in the state of Colorado. You can see it from Denver Airport. You land, look at Denver, and look at the west, and go as far north the biggest mountain you can see. It's Long's. Um, I was probably, the first time I climbed it, it's very spindly 13-year-old, which means all hands, all feet, legs, and zero coordination. Still resemble that now to a degree. And I'm going to put on the screen a picture of what's called the home stretch of Longs. Let's put it, let's put it up there. Okay, there's a home stretch of Longs. So um, that's the last two to 300 feet of the ascent to the summit. And it's not as bad as it looks, but it's pretty bad. Especially if there's ice or water. Obviously, if you, if you slip and roll backwards, you're going to roll for a while. Okay, it's, it's a pretty serious mountain. And that's, that's the final at the top. That's the top right there. So I'm a 13 or 14-year-old following my dad up this thing and my sisters. And you, you tend to, where that arrow shows, you tend to just pick a crack and go up. And the cracks tend to be okay, but sometimes they'll peter out and you've got to change cracks. So I was halfway up this thing. And again, more eyes than arms and legs and was in, trying to, going up. And I had to, my, this thing ended, so I needed to shift to my right about three feet 
to get that next crack. Because I wasn't going to walk on that in-between stuff. It looks really slick and scary. I wasn't going to do that. I was going to find a crack. So I reached out like this to get to the next one, and I didn't quite make it. And I fell against the face of the mountain. Now, it felt like if I took a deep breath and filled my lungs with air, gravity was going to pull me over backwards, and I was going to roll till my next birthday. That's how it felt. It, wasn't, it probably wasn't true, but that's how it felt. I was terrified. So here I am in all my glory on, this, on that, and my dad and sisters are ahead of me, and all I, could, all I could muster up was a help. It's all I had. It's all, I mean, if I do anything else, I'm going. And it wasn't, I didn't get the H out of my mouth and before my dad's big old hand came in and just scooped me up and pulled me over to the appropriate next part of the trail. I think he just shook his head at me and went on. Like, really? You'll grow into yourself, son. And what I realized was he'd been watching me the whole time. And he saw me miss the move. And immediately came back down to 20 or 30 feet he was ahead before I ever, I never knew he was coming. And before I even had a chance to get the prayer out of my mouth, there he was. He saw me. His eyes have been on me the whole time. See, that's a good dad, and that's a good hike master. Good dad, good, hike, good guide, always watching the party, knowing this one's the weak link. I got to keep an eye on him because he's liable to get in trouble, and oh, he did. And he was on me before I had a chance to even get the word out. He wasn't upset with me for not making the cut. He wasn't upset with me for not making the right move. It was just more mountain than I could handle. And there he was. Friends, we're going through a season that's a lot more mountain than most of us can handle. And it's okay. You're not being graded on your performance. Your faith plus God's power, mostly God's power, means you're secure, okay? You gotta know that. Drop the guilt, drop the shame, drop the yeah buts, and enjoy the ever-present rescue of God, okay? The final thing I wanna say is that heaven means suffering is worth it. Peter says, while you may have, to, while you may have had to suffer grief. Grief is emotional pain that comes from circumstances. It comes from physical pain. But grief is that emotional heart wrench that is like you, your gut just hurts. You all know what grief is. It can be inconsolable at times. We've had some of that around here in your lives and mine the last year. A lot of grief, a lot of grief out there. Our friend today grieving a loved one. Though you may have had to deal with grief for a while, you're going to rejoice, First Peter says, because you're going, to, you're going to crest that hill and you're going to see home. Now remember, Peter didn't say, listen, friends, and please don't get mad at me for this. this is, we need to hear this. Peter didn't say, it's going to get better next year. It, and it did. After a while, Rome... In, in another 250 years, 250 years, Christianity became the official religion of Rome, but it was 250 years, and then persecution still continued. It's continuing now around the world. So Peter didn't say, look, just hold on, it's gonna get better. He didn't say that. He didn't say, wait for the next election. He didn't say, wait for the stock market to turn. He didn't say, wait for, he said, look, you're gonna, get, you're gonna crest the hill and you're gonna see home, then it's better. I have to adjust your thinking to what you're, you're an elect exile here. This is not your home. Keep your eyes and your hope there because this world is going to let you down. Jesus, Peter heard Jesus say, Peter heard Jesus say hours before he was ex executed, in the world you will have tribulation. John 16, 33. But then he heard also, but it, take courage, I've overcome the world. Heaven means no matter what happens down here, 
we have a hope there. Heaven means you can get through this because this is not going to win the day. This is not going to go on forever. This too shall pass. He says, for a little while, you may have to suffer all kinds of suffer, go through all kinds of things, but that season's going to end and the sun's going to shine, literally, and it may not change here, but it will change there. And when you finally arrive at where you're supposed to be, then this is like that. It's over. Now, again, friends, I'm not... Americans are all about enjoying our way of life. And I, I'm an American, and I want to enjoy my way of life. We're not promised that in Scripture. Remember my message on immigration a summer ago? We're not here to protect our way of life. As Christians, we're the ones who don't harvest all of our fields because we want the, the poor and the homeless to be able to come in and take from our fields. We're not here to protect our lifestyles as Christians. That's what other people do. We are here to to live in light of heaven and give our lives away. That will run on that platform. You will not get elected saying that. So I want you to think back with me to um, early summer in the weeks following the death of George Floyd. I thought about this this week because of Martin Luther King and because of this message. And I just, I had nothing to say of meaning as I was reeling from what happened and felt very um, ill-equipped at the moment as a pastor to try to speak into the heart of my brothers and sisters of color and be informed. I, 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 can't, I, not, I can't relate to it. They live in a world I don't understand. And where I'm, I love them. I've grown up in Austin, Texas, and have been as close to African Americans as I have Anglos and Hispanics all my life, but I, I don't understand what it's like to be black and be followed at Target just because I'm black. And so I asked several pastors to speak to us, and, and there was a moment when I was interviewing my friend Lawrence Wilkerson from Agape Christian Center. When I get to heaven, I hope I'm with these guys because they party. Bishop, is an, he's been on our stage multiple times. You know this man. He's, he's a lovely, lovely follower of Christ, and I love this man so much. And he's, he was hurting. He was hurting. And I said, Bishop... In light of racism, talk to me about heaven. Talk to me about heaven. And you're not gonna you're not gonna get the pause on the video, but he he sat for the better part of 20 seconds and just thought, and the tears welled up. And then he gave us this. I have to believe that's my hope. I have to believe. I have to believe that what we know on the street, in Target, and sometimes in the church, that is not representative of heaven. Every, every theological bone in my body says it's not, but I spend more time battling with, it's got to be better. My, my ancestors sang songs about it being better. Um, we, it, it was the thing that made them make it through the cotton fields and the civil rights movement. I don't, I don't, I have to believe it's got to be, I have, that is my blessed assurance. Yes, I want to be with Jesus, but I want to be with a Jesus where I'm not going to be a second-class citizen or killed in the street or not admitted to a particular school because of I'm threatening to mess up your, your campus life. So I have to believe that uh, heaven um, is, is the one place while I fight here I fight and I work to enter into that rest. The fight is the fight. The fight is in the street. The fight is in our vote. The fight is in uh, sitting on community boards. It's the one standing up, but I have to believe that when this life is over, this, if, if, if I didn't believe that, then I would be a very, very angry black man. 
my brother Lawrence Wilkerson. I get emotional every time I see that. So what's keeping you from being a very angry, angry person? Because some of you are going through divorces you didn't want. Or you've watched your savings disappear in the last year because of unemployment. Or you've gotten a um, health diagnosis that's pretty much changed your plans and, and turned you from what you wanted to do and wanted to be into something else or someone else. What is keeping bitterness from creeping in? The only answer Peter offered to a people who were literally running for their lives and being persecuted for only believing in something good, the only answer he offered was heaven. It was more than a place where God lives. It was more than a place where you go when you die. It was the place we live from and the place we live for. The place that makes everything okay. The place where justice is done. And the wrinkles get smoothed out. And hope wins. Some of you are disappointed today. My wife jokes, I say, she, my wife likes to joke, and look, look, if life was a dish, you ordered a restaurant, she likes to look at God and say, I'm sorry, this is not what I ordered. And for some of you, this is not what you ordered. And how do you deal with that when life throws at you those Genesis 3 curveballs that can be brutal? It's heaven. It matters now. It brings you hope now. It makes you secure now. It, it reminds you that you have inheritance that is beyond your imagination now. And when you suffer, you'll know the, the, valley of the, dado, the valley of the shadow of death you go through. Even though I go through, what does through imply? You go in one side, but what? You come out the other. Yay, God. Let's pray. Thank you for listening. Thank you guys for watching online. Lord, we love you. <clears throat> Thank you for this word on the reality of your home and what it means to us right now. I pray you'd help us to readjust our expectations and to live from heaven and for heaven. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for hope that doesn't fade. Thank you for inheritance that can't get stolen. Thank you for security that can't be taken away because of a bad day. And thank you for making suffering meaningful. I pray you'll move in, out there in our online congregation right now by the power of your spirit, and I pray you'll move in this room. And I pray it in Jesus' name. So if you'd like to uh, connect with us one more time, at the end of the message, we tend to say, send the word ask. Ask. 866-990-8512. Um, ask stands for acknowledge the rule of reign of God. Seek his kingdom. Or excuse me, seek his people. Affiliate with his people. Don't be alone. And keep your eyes on Jesus. And if you'll text that to us, We'll respond to you in a hurry and how to know more about Christ and how to know more at this church. You guys online, ch stay in chat a while. Okay, talk this one up. God bless you guys.